Good morning, and welcome to Unfolding the Word. I'm glad you could join me today as we continue in our study of the book of Romans, working our way through it verse by verse, which is the pattern we follow in all of the book studies within Unfolding the Word ministry. We've been looking, and began looking actually yesterday, in the first chapter of Romans at verses 18 to 23. Today I want to read verse 18 again, because now we're going to unfold that segment of the first chapter in more depth. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Now what we've seen already, what we've talked about, what in fact Romans has been developing for us, is the principle that all men and women have a struggle and a problem with sin. Everyone has fallen. Later on in the third chapter of Romans, we'll find that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible's very clear that the human condition is that all of us are sinners. And as a result, all of us will stand needing the work of Christ on the cross. We need that gospel. We talked earlier in verse 16 about the power of that gospel. All of us are in a place where we need that power. And in fact, Ephesians 2 and other places develop for us at length this truth that without the gospel, without the power of the gospel, there is not a man or woman alive who is with who has any hope. We are all without hope and without God in this world. Now why? Because the God who is really there, our creator, the one whose love sent his son into this world, the one whose love made a gospel possible for us, is a God who also holds us accountable. He is certainly loving, and that's characteristic of one of God's attributes. But the Bible is very plain that the God who is really there is not merely loving, he is also righteous, he is also holy, and he is also just. The practical point of that, and we developed this a bit already, is that God's justice is as real as God's love, as real as God's mercy. And therefore, the solution to sin, which separates us from God, has to be a solution that satisfies the love of God, the justice of God, the mercy of God, and so forth. And of course, there's only one solution that does that. The solution of the cross, the solution of the Lord Jesus Christ, the solution of the gospel. Now, verse 18 begins to develop for us a little bit more about this issue of our sin, the reality of it, why it's there, what the consequences of it are. He begins in verse 18 by telling us, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. We, as human beings, are all accountable for two issues here to begin with. He says, for ungodliness, and we are accountable for unrighteousness. Let's talk about that a little bit. He begins here, God begins, and says, listen, <clears throat> I'm holding you accountable for ungodliness. The Greek word translated ungodly here literally means, I'm holding you accountable for being irreverent irreverent in relationship to me, the creator God, the Lord and master of the universe. What does it mean to be irreverent of God? Well, essentially it means that we don't respond appropriately to the God who is really there. Well, what's the appropriate response, you may ask? Well, God goes to great lengths to make that plain, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. But Jesus summarized it, you remember, when he, when he was asked, well, what's the greatest commandment? In other words, what's God holding us ultimately accountable for? <clears throat> and the answer that you remember was God commanded that we love him with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength. Well, if that's what being reverent is all about, and by the way it is, <laughs> Who of us is not irreverent? All of us have sinned. All of us break that greatest of the commandments, let alone all of the others. But the greatest one of all, we have broken consistently throughout all of our life and still do at times. 
And we are accountable, God says, before him because he is a just and holy God for irreverence, for breaking of the greatest of the commandments. So ungodliness is the essence and heart or part of the heart of what sin is all about. He then says not only ungodliness, but unrighteousness of men. We are irreverent, ungodly, and we are also unrighteous. <laughs> what does that mean? That means we break God's moral standards. Not only do we break the greatest of the commandments and don't love God in the appropriate manner and thus are irreverent, but we break the moral commandments of the scriptures as well. <laughs> the outcome of all of this, that we are ungodly and unrighteous, is that we are all really broken and stained and sinful people. We stand <laughs> before God in not a very good place. And who that's honest with themselves could dispute what verse 18 is saying is true of the human condition. The consequence of that very sin is that we face accountability before God. Here's the point. Only the gospel changes the equation. Only the gospel prevents us from facing God's wrath. He says, verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed against from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. <laughs> us. The word wrath here, uh, it translates a Greek word which means deep fury, seething righteous indignation. You know, it's possible to be angry properly, to be indignant over wrong that's done. <laughs> that's different than being self-centeredly angry. Uh, and that's the word here, a wrath, a deep, righteous indignation. God's justly indignant. His holiness, his justice, his righteousness, his holiness, his love is indignant against sin. It's, he's indignant against all that is contrary to and opposes his very holy nature. Sin is not merely an academic issue with God. Sin causes wrath. And it demands, because of the very justice of God, within the framework of a moral uni universe, it demands a solution, a penalty be paid for that reason, for God's righteous indignation against us. And of course, that's where the gospel comes in. The gospel that God offers is God's solution. It is the opportunity to solve the dilemma. Through the gospel, God gives a sinner a choice. Here's the choice. Will your future be one characterized by forgiveness and acceptance before the holy God that you've sinned against? Or will it be one of accountability and wrath? The choice falls into our hands. How do we have a choice? Because God in his love initiated the gospel, which allows a choice finally to be made for us. Those that place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ move from facing inescapable accountability for God, before God, for their unrighteousness, for their ungodliness, and they move instead forgiveness and life and grace. Jesus talked about this in John chapter 5, verse 24. Listen to this. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment. He's passed from death into life. <laughs> there is a choice for people. We don't have a choice whether we are accountable in sinners, because we are. Our choice is what we do about it. The passage 18 in verse 18 also says, not only are all people accountable for ungodliness, irreverence, and unrighteousness, but he says all people are also guilty of suppressing the truth. The word suppress comes from a Greek word meaning to put in detention, to obscure. Our sinful rebellion against God is made all the worse because we actively work to suppress the truth of God in the midst of the culture we find ourselves in and suppress it from our conscious awareness 
is a day-to-day -day reality. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. Each has turned to his own way, not God's way. That's the truth of humanity. We turn away from what we know to be true about God. And then we work to not only turn ourselves, but to keep turning other people from that. What a terrible indictment to be a truth suppressor. And it's that indictment that will expand on tomorrow. Join me then, won't you, as we continue to look at these very important verses in the book of Romans. God bless.